So welcome everybody. My name is Martha Stroud and I'm the Associate Director and Senior Research Officer at the USC Shoah Foundation Center for Advanced Genocide Research. On behalf of the center and our co-sponsor for this event, the USC Department of Gender and Sexuality Studies, I'm excited to welcome all of you, as you can tell. As we get underway, we would like to acknowledge that the USC Shoah Foundation Center for Advanced Genocide Research is located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Tongva people, the traditional land caretakers of the, of the Tovangar, which is the Los Angeles Basin and Southern Channel Islands. Along with the Tongva, we also recognize the Chumash, the Tataviam, Serrano, Kuiya, and Peom Kuwicham peoples for the land that USC occupies around Southern California, and we pay respects to their elders past and present. So just a quick comment before we get underway about the Zoom protocols. We're going to have time for questions and discussion after the lecture, so we really invite and encourage your participation, your questions, and your comments. You can use the Q&A feature below. After the lecture, we'll re-enable the chat, which we're gonna disable shortly, so you can ask questions in the chat. And you can also ask questions on audio if you choose to by, by um, using the raise hand feature below. When considering how to ask your question, please keep in mind that this lecture is being recorded and will be available widely, including the discussion. So if you have concerns about privacy, perhaps using the chat or the Q&A function would be a better option for you. One more comment before we get going. In the next four weeks, the center has three more events scheduled. So we invite you to visit our website to learn more about them and to register to attend. We, my colleague Badema has put the link to the events website in the chat so you can find it there. We hope that you'll join us for the upcoming lectures. So now to introduce today's lecture and speaker, it's my pleasure to introduce the founding director of the USC Shoah Foundation Center for Advanced Genocide Research, Professor Wolf Gruner. Thank you, Marta. And I'm also delighted uh, to uh, see from there, uh, all over the world, uh, people are watching uh, this lecture and we are really excited to uh, present uh, Lauren Cantillion uh, today. But first I wanna say that uh, this lecture is organized by the Center for Advanced Genocide Research at the Shaw Foundation, uh, which uh, organizes a wide range of academic programming, including uh, conferences, international conferences, um, uh, events like this le uh, lecture series and also has a lively fellowship program. And today's lecture is the annual lecture of the Robert J. Katz Research Fellow in Genocide Studies lecture. Um, the Robert J. Katz Research Fellow in Genocide Studies fellowship enables an advanced standing PhD candidate from any discipline and anywhere in the world uh, to pursue research with the testimonies of the Visual History Archive. It was named long, uh, after longtime volunteer and former Board of Counsel's Chair Robert J. Katz in recognition of his service to the Shaw Foundation. Bob Katz has played an instrumental role in the center's programs and activities since our founding, always providing important advice and asking uh, thoughtful questions. So we thank him for his involvement in our work and we are delighted to have an opportunity to celebrate his contributions today through this annual lecture. I also wanted to mention that this lecture is co-sponsored by the USC Dornsife Department of Gender and Sexuality Studies. And now it's my uh, distinct pleasure to introduce Lauren Cantillion as the 2020-2021 Robert J. Katz Research Fellow in Genocide Studies. She is a PhD candidate uh, currently at the Department of Culture, Media and Creative Studies, uh, Creative Industries, as you can see here on the screen, at King's College London. She earned her MA in European Jewish uh, History at Queen Mary University of London. Her dissertation project 
Remembering Remediating uh, Women's Stories of Sexual Violence During the Holocaust, explores uh, the how, how do women narrate, express, and embody their recollections of sexual uh, abuse and violence during the Holocaust. Uh, her research uh, sits at the intersection of memory, gender, and genocide and mass violence. And uh, in a forthcoming book chapter, uh, she uh, explores how artists uh, have challenged the British government's invocation of the emotional regime of the Second World War as part of their response to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, which is a, a different topic than what we will hear today. Uh, she has also uh, been involved uh, since 2019 uh, with the King's College London Arts and Humanities Research Institute and is uh, present at present is also working to uh, uh, improve institutional research culture for scholars uh, of emotionally tasking research at King's College uh, in London. So please uh, all welcome Lauren Cantillion, our current uh, Robert J. Katz Research Fellow for her lecture. Hi everyone, and um, thank you so much for joining me this evening or morning or afternoon, wherever you are in the world. I would like to thank the USC Shaw Foundation Center for Advanced Genocide Research for awarding me the Robert J. Katz Fellowship for 2020-2021. It's an award and opportunity that means so much to me, both to have your support for this project and the belief in me as a scholar. It feels like not so long ago that I was watching Shaw Foundation interviews on YouTube as a teenager, utterly enthralled that you could watch interviews with Holocaust survivors on YouTube. To go from that to speaking to you all today as a fellowship holder is a very special moment. More specifically, I would like to thank the Centre for Advanced Genocide Research team, Wolf Gruner, Martha Stroud and Bud Emma Pittich. It's been such a joy and privilege to find people who really understood the project and me from the start. They've given thought provoking feedback, inspired me down new paths, offered reassurance and encouragement in moments of confusion and overwhelm. The three of you have been such brilliant mentors over the past few weeks, even from afar, and with the added challenge of negotiating time zones. Thank you so much for everything. Crispin Brooks and Eta Gordon have also been extremely generous with their time and reflections, particularly in terms of indexing and the archive. Thanks also to Shay Anthony Jana and Paul Lerner, both of whom offered up much food for thought, in addition to making me feel a little bit more connected to the USC community from here in London. Getting to know my fellow fellows, Florian Zabransky and Chad Gibbs, has also been a real highlight of this experience. Closer to home, my research in general would be impossible without the support of my loved ones, family, friends and colleagues, colleagues who are friends. Your regular encouragement and videos of cats are what keep me grounded. Last week, Lawrence Langer spoke at the Wiener Holocaust Library via Zoom and said the following. For me, I manage the work I do on the Holocaust because the other part of my life is driven by the experience of love. That is certainly the case for me. <coughs> now to change slides. Okay, so this is um, just to introduce you to my broader PhD topic. My thesis seeks to explore how Jewish women recount personal memory narratives of sexualized violence during the Holocaust. The women whose stories make up this project are all individuals who recount the story of assault as something that happened to them personally. The primary questions of this study are, how do these women express such memories within a public Holocaust testimony sharing context? What position do first-hand stories of sexual assaults occupy in relation to a woman's wider Holocaust testimony narrative? How do women tell these stories across different interview project frameworks, mnemonic genres, and time? In responding to these research questions, I also explore the diversity of feelings and emotions expressed by these women, looking past the dominant paradigm of shame and silence to arrive at a more complex understanding of women's emotions in the public recounting of memories of sexual assault. It is a feminist project and an interdisciplinary one, drawing on work from fields including memory studies, narrative studies, history of the emotions, work on violence against women and girls during conflict and other genocides, legal histories, feminist theory, and even a little bit of psychology. 
The research also stands on the shoulders of the vast literature around women's gendered experience of the Holocaust, but is in particular conversation with the work of the people, mostly women, who make up this very much non-exhaustive list on screen. Much of the literature specific to sexualized violence against women and girls during the Holocaust suggests a lack of availability of first-hand recounting, and so has tended to focus on the concept of second-hand storytelling, the presence of silence, perpetrator narratives, or cultural representations of these assaults as depicted in film, museum exhibitions, art, and literature. As this presentation will highlight today, I would suggest that this is not the case. That's my PhD. Now let me tell you about what I've been doing over the past few weeks as part of the fellowship. Prior to starting the fellowship, I had identified 49 women who recount in the first-hand voice, and the main aim of the fellowship was to identify more women. My initial survey was shaped by the Visual History Archive, and I will therefore, no, from here, refer to the Visual History Archive as the VHA. Um, so my initial survey was shaped by the VHA's indexing terms. I used 30, with the further filters of being recorded in English, that the video was of a woman survivor and that she would be a Jewish survivor. This returned a result of 1,144 segments spread through 884 individual videos. At this moment in time, the number of women I have identified has increased from 49 to 386. And as there are several other avenues I have not yet had the time to explore, it is possible that this number will grow even further. In addition, I had planned to focus on exploring the tensions and textures of emotions present in Jewish women's personal memory narratives of sexualized violence during the Holocaust. And I have gathered together some initial thoughts based on the early analysis I've been able to do. But I have to be honest and say, that I really underestimated the time it would take me to listen to that 1,144 segments that formed my initial watch list. That took several weeks. So while I have been making notes and identifying patterns and interesting occurrences for further investigation, please note that the reflections I share with you today are early thoughts, very much in progress and very fresh. In some ways, my brain still hasn't finished processing everything it's listened to and had to think about recently, which also made putting this, presentation, uh, putting this presentation together somewhat challenging. As you can imagine, there was a lot to choose from. Just to be clear, I have not managed to, um, you know, to overcome time to watch 871 videos in their entirety. And yes, this makes me unhappy. Aside from likely missing relevant comments and interviews that the indexing does not tag, it makes me uncomfortable to have, in a sense, um, reduce these women to their stories of sexual assault. In my normal practice, once identifying a woman, I do watch the full interview, but in such a condensed time period as this fellowship, that would not have been a practical approach. Having said that, in many cases, I did watch extended sections of the return search results so as to be able to situate the story being told. When I've decided which of the 386 women's stories I want to work with in more depth for my thesis, I will, of course, go back and watch those women's interviews in full as per my usual practice. For this presentation, I was asked to consider any insights I had gathered from the fellowship. I'm thrilled to say that not unexpectedly, my time in the VHA has been nothing short of transformative for my research. Some of the questions I was most excited about having a chance to explore were things like how do first-hand stories of sexual assault interact with an individual's wider Holocaust narrative? Are they elicited by the interviewer through a direct question? Do they emerge more organically as part of an individual's Holocaust narrative? Based on my deeper listening to the, interview, to the interviews of the original 49 women previously identified, and now this recent fellowship period, I would like to suggest that there are, for now, three main ways in which these stories make themselves present. The first is that they are embedded within women's broader Holocaust narratives. That is to say that, on the whole, women who were interviewed as part of the survivors of the Shoah Visual History Foundation project, today's Shoah Foundation, recount their stories of sexual assault in keeping with the Shoah Foundation's preferred chronological narrative structure. The same is true for women who took part in other testimony gathering projects that adopted a similar methodology. 
These women connect their memory of sexual assault to other memories that took place in the same location. For instance, stories about assaults in ghettos and camps tend to appear in that corresponding section of the interview, embedded within and in connection to other memories. This is particularly the case for vaginal assaults carried out in the context of body searches, as well as for stories told across the overt covert spectrum, including sideways storytelling. The second group are women who break off from this chronological structure to go back and include something they previously did not mention. This is instigated by the women themselves, which is an important point in terms of thinking about women's agency and their choice to record these stories publicly. Examples of this include the phrases on your screen. This group of women are, I think, particularly interesting because they could have let these stories remain unrecorded, that they in effect halt the interview to return to an earlier time block suggests that they really cared about getting their memories of sexual assault recorded and were assertive in doing so. They wanted and made a conscious choice for them to be part of their Holocaust testimony. The third group are women who offer their stories in response to a question from the interviewer, but not a question specifically related to sexual assault. Instead, the question is more general, such as the examples on your screen. These ideas will likely further develop over the next few months as I write my thesis, uh, sorry. But as a starting point, these three patterns of emergence suggest that unlike Joan Ringelheim's off-cited example of Pauline, the survivor who finds the connection between gender and genocide difficult to integrate into her Holocaust story, that there are a significant number of women for whom this integration is not a challenge. So we come to emotions. Um, emotions are complicated. Who, who'd have thought it? In a recent article on the history of anger, Thomas Dixon warned of the twin dangers of anachronism and essentialism in the history of emotions. My approach here is informed by Dixon's warning, particularly around essentialism, as well as the work of Tillman Habermas on emotion and narrative in autobiographical storytelling. I first encountered analysis on ambiguity through the work of Paula Reeby and Stephen D. Brown, who explore the memory narratives of survivors of child abuse in everyday settings, not conflict or genocide. Reviewing literature for this presentation, it was nice also to be reminded of its presence in the writing of Gabby Zipfel, as well as Regina Morhauser. I find ambiguity a really useful concept through which to think about layers of emotion and feeling, because it's a state that is itself inherently layered. As for shame, I'm interested in its interaction with other emotions and how that shapes women's storytelling rather than just pointing to its presence. I return again to the work of Regina Mulhauser, who recently pointed out that defining the primary harm caused by sexual violence in terms of stigma and shame brings further problems. It reinforces the alleged inevitability of shame as a natural response by the individual victim. It assumes that families and communities will always shame and stigmatize the victims. I think about this idea a lot. We come to our first survivor. This is Lucina Goldberg, born in Warsaw, April 1925. As with all three clips I'll be playing, this clip is taken from a Sher Foundation conducted interview. Lucina's interview took place in Montreal, Canada during December 1997. She was interviewed by Rachel Alcalay. Lucina is, a, is an important person for me. I was aware of her story prior to this fellowship, largely because her interview is available through the regular level of VHA access and her story of rape is indexed under the term sexual assault. So she was really easy to find when I was scoping for first-hand accounts. Her specific importance for me in the context of emotion is because she was the first woman I watched who, to my mind at the time, expressed anger as part of her recounting. In her interview, Lucina recounts how, after several attempts, she escaped from the Warsaw Ghetto and tried to live in the city under false Christian papers. She moved around a lot to avoid detection and received help from a member of the Polish underground who had worked for her family before the war. He sent her out of the city to the countryside, thinking she would be safer living with his mother. Unfortunately, the arrangement did not work out. Here, Lucina continues that story. And then 
she sent me to Warsaw the day when, no, she sent me the day when, when was the Polish uprising. Which was when? That was this when? was 1944, but oh. I went through a terrible thing before. What, what I, terrible thing? I went through terrible things because when they arrested this man, she told me to go. I had no place to go. And this woman, what was her name? Mrs. Smith. It was Mrs. Smith. It was Mrs. Smith, an older Mrs. Smith. Mm -hmm. She sent me and she said, you have to go right away. And I went from one place to the, to the other and I stay in a garden. It was a Warsaw Saski, Saski Ogród. That's the name uh, of the park? Of the park during the day. There were children playing and it was the time when we were playing as, a, as children. I was during the day and at night I had to go somewhere. So I went to one of the homes and I stayed in the cellar because the cellars were open and I was so used to go under because I used to go with my parents, my, my grandparents that I somehow survive number of nights. But when I remember that, I just don't know how desperate I was. And one day, going from the park, I saw a place which was go with us to Germany. I went there and I met a man who said, you want to go to Germany, you must be Jewish. It was the end of the war, it was nearly 44, uh, spring 44. This man was what nationality? He was Polish. And maybe you're not, or maybe you are. You have blue eyes, you are blonde, but who can be desperate like you? And he used terrible force and he raped me. And I had. I was fighting with him. So I don't know how I ran away from there. I think he he just sit there. I remember he sit there with his head like this and he said, why, why? Like he talked to himself, you know, because I hurt him a lot too. Did you? How? You I kicked him, I, I didn't want him to, you know. Yes. I still felt that uh, he has no rights, maybe I was Jewish or not, but I lived always in freedom. <laughs> when I reviewed Lucina's recounting as part of putting this talk together, I was slightly confused. For so long I had mentally designated her as being angry, and yet when I watched this back, I wasn't sure if that was necessarily the best word to describe what is going on in her storytelling. It felt like there was something more complex to be unpacked. To focus on the extract on screen, we can read a few layers here, which I've marked up with an underline. We have the actions that Lutina recounts as part of her memory, where she describes how she kicked her attacker and hurt him a lot in retaliation, trying to incapacitate him. This is the layer of fight in the contemporary moment of the assault. In addition, there are things detectable in the moment of recounting. When she said, I was fighting with him, Lucina's voice thickened and her voice boomed on the word fighting. There's also a second boom moment at the end on the words in freedom. And it's there, like at, at that in freedom moment, uh, that, that, oh, I've lost my place. Where am I? Yeah, here we go, sorry. And it's there that it clicked to my mind that what we can observe here is a woman feeling indignant. Another option here was outrage, but when you go into definitions of outrage compared to indignant, indignant is a better fit. Let's think about the meaning of indignant here. So indignant may be defined as affected with indignation, provoked to wrath by something regarded as unworthy, unjust or ungrateful, moved by an emotion of anger mingled with scorn or contempt, inflamed at once with anger and disdain. Note that we are actually still in the territory of anger. 
but I'm trying to be more specific and take into account the micro points of Lucina's recounting. This is also with Dixon's words about essentialism in mind. I also think that disdain is a really interesting word in that particular definition. If we go back another step to a definition of indignation, thinking about how um, that previous definition had the phrase affected with indignation, we get yet more resonance with Lucina's interview. One definition of indignation is anger at what is regarded as unworthy or wrongful. Lucina's understanding of this rape as unworthy or wrongful is evident in her words when she says, I didn't want him to, I still felt that he has no rights, paraphrasing. I then had a look at the connected word indignity, which is where things get really interesting to me. We can define indignity as treatment or circumstances that cause one to feel shame or to lose one's dignity. Why do I think this is worth getting excited about? Recently, I've started to engage with Elspeth Proben's work in which she proposes that shame can be productive. This is the antithesis of the secondary literature that exists around sexualized violence against women and girls during the Holocaust, in which shame is often portrayed as a key factor as to why there is a perceived lack of first-hand accounts of sexual assault. Having traveled backwards through these interconnected meanings, is it possible to bring shame forward? Has shame played a productive, transformative role in terms of Lucina's expressed indignation? For now, I don't know. As I said before, this is very much a snapshot into my working thought process, but it's an idea I want to explore further across other women's interviews, and then, if it makes sense, develop as part of my thesis. Our second woman um, that I want to introduce you to is Olga Kovac. Olga was born in Szalgotarian, Hungary in May 1926. Her interview was conducted by Dorothy Shaloff Simons in New York, June 1995. During the section of the interview this clip is taken from, Olga recounts her memories of deportation from the Shalgotarian ghetto to Auschwitz-Birkenau in June 1944. Uh, and she goes on to mention that she thinks she arrived in Birkenau in, on Thursday, the 15th of June. So she's very specific memories. Dorothy, her interviewer, asks for some more detail about who was involved with the rounding up and deportation of Shalgatarian's Jewish population. This is the point of the conversation that we join. Who told you what to do to prepare for the transport? The Shalgatarian. Were there... And the, and the military. The Hungarian military? Yes, yes. Were there Germans? I don't know, but probably the SS was guarding the planes. I don't know, I don't remember, but the Hungarians were just as bad, as evil as the SS. You couldn't get any worse than the Hungarians, the, the, those Hungarians who collaborated. Believe it or not, before we left the ghetto, they subjected us to uh, a gynecological search. I saw my piano teacher standing in one room and they took us behind the, behind the screen and even my small cousins, they were, told, they, were, they were in their teens between eight and 12, they were subjected to this. I mean, how, how worse, how, how more degenerate can they get, all the Hungarians. So up to this ta time, almost all of your contact was with the Hungarians, the Hungarians and not the Germans at all? Most probably in the background, that was the Ger I mean, German, Hungary was uh, occupied by the Germans. And then when we came back from the camp and I met this piano uh, teacher of mine, I asked him, Professor Vadasi, V-A-D-A-S-Z-I, how could you do it? And he told me something to the effect that I did not have any other choice. I don't remember his exact words, but this is just about what he said. I could have killed him. Did 
did anyone make any attempt to resist at all during this time? Who okay. <clears throat> in the same way as noted in Lucina's clip, here we are able to differentiate multiple layers of emotion and feeling in Olga's recounting. If we consider her recounted actions and emotions as a connected but separate layer to the Olga in the recorded present of the interview. More significantly, however, I would like to draw your attention to how Olga describes her assault, specifically the vocabulary she has to employ so as to communicate this assault to her interviewer. For a moment, Olga struggles to identify what she feels to be an accurate term, using filler words and pauses to allow her time to think. Her eventual choice to draw on medical terminology, the gynecological search, as she calls it, to describe this particular type of sexual assault is a common choice for women in this archive. Examined is another frequent word choice. It is the type of assault that I have the most women talking about in terms of what I've sourced over the fellowship period. The phrase gynecological search obscures the reality of what Olga is trying to tell us. To paraphrase Lynn Higgins and Brenda Silver, we as listeners are required to restore the violence and sexuality back into this text from where it has been deflected. This so-called gynecological search is a sexual assault. Can you hear me? Sorry to mm -hmm. sorry to interrupt your talk, but your yes. audio got very garbled um, for the last few minutes. So I don't know if you want to try turning off your video temporarily. And are you still with us? Thank you everybody for your patience with the technical difficulties. Let's see. I think it kicked me out. <laughs> oh, well, you're back now and we can all, we can all see you. So it was, yeah, now it's, it's doing it again. It's garbling your, your audio. How about now? Yeah, it's still sort of garbled um, and your video is frozen. Maybe you could turn off your video for a moment and see if that helps because often, yeah. can, can you try speaking? Yeah, I, I'm speaking now. Uh, can you it's hear me? A, little, a little garbled <laughs> and a little robotic. Um, okay. Let's just take a deep breath, everybody, and thank you again for your patience. And then, Lauren, can you try speaking again? Hi, Martha. How's Hi. the weather? <laughs> it's a beautiful day here in California. Uh, yeah, that sounded that sounded better than before. Okay. I mean, do you want me to keep going without video for the moment and then maybe just turn the video on for the third clip? Do you think that would help? Yeah, I think that would help for the moment. You're still experiencing some audio distortion or we're still hearing a little bit of audio distortion. Um, okay. But I think if you return to your analysis of the clip is where we is where everything started to sort of get garbled and just We'll try it just audio <laughs> for a few moments and then see see how we go. Okay. Okay. Right. Yeah, sure. So uh, yeah, I will just go from the point that I carried on from the clip. <clears throat> that would be fantastic. Thank you, Lauren, for your patience with this. And thanks again to the attendees. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Sorry, this sounds very strange to just say all this again, but We'll go with it. In the same way as noted in Latina's clip, here we are able to differentiate multiple layers of emotion and feeling in Olga's recounting if we consider her recounted actions and emotions as a connected but separate layer to the Olga in the recorded present of the interview. 
More significantly, however, I would like to draw your attention to how Olga describes her assault, specifically the vocabulary she has to employ so as to communicate this assault to her interviewer. For a moment, Olga struggles to identify an accurate term using filler words and pauses to allow her time to think. Her eventual choice to draw on medical terminology, the so-called gynecological search, to describe this particular type of sexual assault is a common choice for women in this archive. Examined is another frequent choice, word choice. It is the type of sexual assault that I have the most women talking about in terms of what I have sourced over the fellowship period. The phrase gynecological search obscures the reality of what Olga is trying to tell us. To paraphrase Lynn Higgins and Brenda Silva, we as listeners are required to restore the violence and sexuality back into this text from which it has been deflected. This so-called gynecological search is a sexual assault because an, un an undefined person put their fingers into Olga's vagina without her consent as part of a forced search process. The power dynamics at work here are entirely unbalanced. From here on, I will refer to this type of sexual assault as a vaginal assault, which is an imperfect term, but a reasonably straightforward one for the purposes of this talk. This type of vaginal assaulting of women and girls, and this really does include young girls, thinking of Olga's mention of her eight and 12 year old cousins, took place in a variety of spaces and places, e.g. when Jewish families were forced into ghettos, during the deportation from ghettos to camps, and when women arrived at camps. They also feature in interviews when held with Jewish women who managed to escape Nazi Germany during the mid to late 1930s, which I had not expected to find. Not that I was looking for, it was just something I didn't expect to come across. When asked by interviewers why they thought, why they think vaginal assaults happened across these varying contexts, women tend to relate it to the never ending search by Nazi officials and local collaborators for often imagined Jewish wealth and valuables. This greed drove officials to believe that Jewish women and girls would secrete these items in their vaginas. Other women were told that these were medically necessary as part of hygiene precautions against lice. For Hungarian Jewish women like Olga, vaginal assault in this context was likely to be carried out by a local midwife, a gendarme, a soldier, or a combination of all three. This meant that, as was the case for Olga, women and girls often knew the people who subjected them to these assaults, an extra layer of betrayal. Here we see and hear Olga's anger directed toward her former piano teacher, who is a presence in this story. We hear her anger in the tone of her voice as it breaks and booms, as well as anger being narratively present in what she recounts. Can we see it though? One of the reasons why I enjoy working with audiovisual testimony is because it enables you to read the body as part of, so part of someone's storytelling process. So I think we can see her anger. With this in mind, um, and hopefully this works with all the tech, um, I would like you to try something now at home. You may have noticed, or maybe not, again, because of the tech, that Olga did something very specific in the clip when she said the phrase, I could have killed him. On the word killed, she bares her teeth. Try saying the word killed in an average, everyday sort of way. Now try saying it with your teeth bared. Can you feel a difference? There is force required to engage your mouth to do that. Force driven by strong feelings and emotions. There is anger, pain, sadness. Maybe this is outrage, observable in Olga's recounting. But I want to circle back to the significance of Olga's choice of medical terminology to describe a sexual assault and why this is important. These types of vaginal assault were regularly carried out by midwives or individuals presented as doctors. Uh, this last one is more in the, as in the doctors, uh, is more in the setting of a concentration camp and multiple women also accused prisoner doctors of ha as having been complicit in carrying out these vaginal assaults. 
that state actors, medical professionals and equipment were involved in combination with the ability to explain why they, why they happened in relation to the search for Jewish wealth seems to have provided the assaults with a layer of legitimacy. There are women who describe this type of vaginal assault as a sexual assault in more overt ways in their interview. For instance, one woman says, you could say it was finger rape, it wasn't penis rape. And another woman reflects on her personal journey to the knowledge that she was sexually assaulted. Women frequently include details like that it was a dirty, ungloved finger that violated their vagina, that brutal force was used during that insertion, and many reference the concept of virginity. If we consider their stories en masse, these women are more than aware that they have been sexually assaulted, but struggle in the main to overcome that layer of fake legitimacy, and so are unable to find a universal key term through which to communicate this type of assault as sexual assault that does not re require decoding. That's fine if you have the time to do a close textual reading of how women talk about these types of vaginal assaults, like what I've been doing, but more challenging on a case-by-case -case basis to incorporate into an archival indexing framework, say. Having said that, there's also a sense of irony here. On the one hand, women's use of medical terminology in recounting, as informed by the contextual conditions of the assault, act as camouflage for what were, in some cases, fairly systematic sexual assaults. Yet, if you know what you're looking for and how to decode that, the medical terminology could also be considered as a vehicle through which the act of sharing a story of sexual assault in a public forum, what Teresa DeLange has termed speaking private memory to public power, was made easier. Again, something to think about. Um, Martha, I've come to my third and final woman. Shall we have a go at the technology? So I think what we should do, Lauren, is I'll play the clip. I think you, should, you should attempt to come back on camera. Okay. Um, and I will play the clip from my side and then Great. you can analyze it. And if you want to try to pull up your PowerPoint again, you could, but not yet because I'm going to play mm -hmm. the clip first. I don't think it's that necessary. Are you ready for the clip now or are you going to? Yes, please. Face? Okay. One moment. Oh, actually, no, okay. I apologize. I'll I'm, not, I'm nearly ready. Okay. We're just moving on to woman number three. <laughs> uh, in so our third woman is Inga Frank, uh, who was born Ingeborg Frankenstein in Berlin, May 1925, and was interviewed in Brooklyn, New York in January 1996. The clip we'll hopefully be watching occurs just shy of halfway through the full interview and is embedded within a collection of four stories that are thematically linked. Laurie Fine, the interviewer, was comfortable with Inga as following an associative storytelling path, which I believe is what enabled these stories to emerge. Inga was deported to Theresienstadt as part of the third Altus transport from Berlin on June 5th, 1942. Her name appears on documents confirming this that are accessible through the Arlson archives. At this point of the interview, Inga is answering Laurie's general questions about life in Trezienstadt. As part of this exchange, Inga then recounts a story that amuses her about being 18 years old, having a boyfriend and running to her mother after her boyfriend kissed her on the mouth as she was concerned she was no longer a virgin. Laurie then asks, for more interviews about free time in Theresienstadt, to which Inga replies, what free time, while laughing. She provides some examples, but within 20 seconds, Inga has brought up a story about being falsely accused of Russian Shanda back in Berlin when she was 15, consciously breaking with the, chron the chronological structure of the interview, saying, I'm going back now. Thankfully, Laurie allows her to pursue this associative path. Inga seems to draw on the story of the false accusation as a way to illustrate her lack of awareness about anything related to sex. Uh, I'm gonna have to read this out, sort of roughly paraphrasing, um, which I'm not usually a fan of doing, but because of the technology, I'll do it. She says, I didn't know what they were talking about in regard to the intense and abusive questioning that she was put through by people she identifies as having been Gestapo agents. She also recounts, here we go with the words that would be on the slide, 
that she was taken to a hospital with two, where two doctors, a man and a woman, somehow identified she was still a virgin. I had to get climb on this table with my legs in the air and they held a mirror or something under me. The woman said, what next? They're sending us babies now? And then she laughs. She said, get dressed, go home. It took me a long time to figure out what she was saying. She wanted to know if I had any sexual relations with the, I didn't know what she was talking about. This marks Inga's switch to a more somber tone. She somewhat disjointedly reflects on this memory of being accused of Russian Shanda before beginning the clip that we will now watch. If you could please, Martha, thank you. One moment, please. I was very, very hungry. And somebody in the kitchen that was intelligent gave me a slice of bread and one of the Germans saw it and he was not too happy about it and he took me and I can only put it to rape me. He said, as long as I wanted the bread, I had to earn it. Because I didn't eat the bread, I didn't want it anymore. Then I started to grow up and say, this is what it's coming, what this, now I'm nothing. I, they can do anything they want now. Did he ever come near you again? No. Did anybody ever see? Did anybody know what happened? No. I never told my mother. I never, my brother doesn't know. I never told him. As a matter of fact, he said he wants to see the tape. I said, oh, I'm not going to get one. I don't want him to know. It's, you know. I, I find even it wasn't my fault, but I, I was very ashamed of this whole thing. Still am. I'm 70, I'm still ashamed of uh, that it should have happened that way. Thanks, Martha. The fourth story that follows on concerns Inga's memory of watching the humiliation of an older Jewish man in Theresienstadt when, and I quote, two young Nazis decided they're gonna have fun with him. Inga then concludes, and I quote, then I started hating them and I prayed to God to kill them all. Don't let one of them escape, which was wrong, I admit. I shouldn't have, but I couldn't help myself. Same as with our previous two women, can you see a pattern here? There's a lot going on in this section of Inga's interview, but a few points to think about first is how these stories flow from one to the next. A light-hearted story about sexual innocence, being kissed by her boyfriend, becomes a darker story of innocence, which in turn brings up Inga's memory of being raped, followed by a story of witnessing a different kind of violent humiliation. Alongside these story shifts, there is an accompanying emotional flux that takes place, culminating in the admission of a deeply rooted hatred. More specifically, however, I want to draw your attention to a key moment in Inga's recounting, which is when she says that she knows the rape was not her fault, but that she still feels ashamed. Inga's positioning here is highly ambiguous. What does ashamed mean? One definition is affected with shame, abashed or put to confusion by a consciousness of guilt or error disconcerted by a recognition that one's actions or circumstances are in any way not to one's credit. The key thing there is the, um, the consciousness of guilt or error. But in the same sentence, Inga is able to vocalize the correct knowledge that this assault was not her fault, which we would expect to, neg to negate any feelings of guilt. It's even what she says first. Her starting point is that this wasn't her fault. There is a duality of being able to articulate these two apparently opposing opinions, 
which maybe points to a tension between a self-understanding and external wider cultural impositions of shame. To my mind, this is an important thing to home in on. And again, I will continue to develop this idea further. Uh, so this next section, uh, I was asked to reflect as well as any insights of the fellowship, I was asked to reflect on any problems I encountered. So this seems like a good place to talk about the Visual History Archives indexing system, how it shapes my work and its general impact on accessing first-hand accounts of sexualized violence during the Holocaust. Considering I've spent a lot of this talk telling you about the significant number of women I've found who do share a first-hand account, you could be forgiven for wondering why I'm talking about the index as a problem. I couldn't do my project without the index. If we didn't have it, it would be like looking for needles hidden within fields of haystacks. But there is room for improvement. For instance, there are stories of sexual assault that remain unindexed. The stories of Lucina Goldberg and, and, and excuse me, and Inga Frank are indexed under the tags sexual assaults and ghetto sexual assaults, respectively. Yet Olga Kovacs's story is not indexed by any term related to sexual assault, not even body searches. Her story is instead indexed under deportation procedures and Hungarian police and security forces. I found her not through the indexing system, but by following a citation trail courtesy of Noah Schenker's book, Reframing Holocaust Testimony. Of course, there's nothing inherently wrong in following a citation trail. And it's not a surprise that out of the three examples I shared, it's the more coded story of sexual assault that remains unindexed. But it illustrates the disparity between the indexing of overt stories of sexual assault and more nuanced covert recounting in the VHA, which in turn has an impact on knowledge production and memory. Related to this is how stories of child sexual assault are often not indexed as such. There is a tag, child abuse, which is defined by the VHA as the physical mistreatment and or sexual violation of children. The VHA further defines a child as under the age of 13. Personally, I think you could stretch this to age 14 and under, but let's go with the VHA definition for now. 43 out of my 386 women were aged 12 and under at the time of their assault. And out of that 43, just two are indexed under the child abuse tag. If the definition of a child was to include all girls aged 14 and under, that number would rise from 43 to 96. While the vast majority of these 40 plus stories are indexed by the spatially defined tags that relate to sexual assault and sexual activities, without the addition of the child abuse tag, they are not easily recognizable or accessible in the way that they should be. In their volume, Gendered Wars, Gendered Memories, Asa Gul Alpne and Andrea Petu cite anthropologist Michelle Ruff Trulo's four moments when silences enter the process of historical production. For this conversation, fact assembly, the making and collecting of archives, and the moment of fact retrieval, the making of narratives, are key. For fact assembly, we may ask why the term child abuse blends together stories of non-sexual child abuse and child sex assault, or that it seeks to. For fact retrieval, these stories are irretrievable unless you get creative and are willing to work through large numbers of stories, gathering all relevant details needed to work out someone's age at the time of their assault. Would it not be more straightforward if that information was included as part of the original indexing process? In saying this, it is not my intent to rubbish the long hours of concentration, care and labor that the indexers put in. At the end of the day, this process is a human one. Indexers listen for a myriad of knowledge points, have thousands of indexing terms to choose from, and at certain points during the archive's history have had tough targets of numbers of videos to get indexed by a deadline. You have the further complication that in terms of indexing stories of sexualized violence more generally, some of these stories frankly defy the binary categories of the index. 
I've certainly come across stories in the past few weeks that made me think really hard about what tag I would use. What I'm trying to suggest is that we can do better so as to enable these stories to be more accessible. With all this in mind, I'm extremely pleased and rather humbled to say that I have been invited by the Shoah Foundation to help improve this process, as well as refine some of the indexing terms and help them index the stories I have found, like that of Olga Kovacs, that are not indexed at this moment in time. I'm aware that I'm at the limits of my time, so just gonna wrap up. But one final question needs answering. How has the fellowship shaped my PhD going forward? Earlier on, I used the word transformative and I use it again here. The opportunity to immerse in these stories and talk to the CAGR team about my work in real time has opened up so many, arguably too many, new avenues of interest for this project. It will be a very difficult decision as to whose stories I do or not include from here. The stories and the women who share them are compelling, they are complex, and they are so worthy of our attention. Thank you for listening and for being patient, and I will try my best with any questions you may have. Thanks. Thank you so much, Laura. And if we were all in a room together, you would be hearing thunderous applause, I have no doubt. Um, so now we're going to open it up for questions. You can type questions into the chat, into the Q&A feature at the bottom. Uh, and also you can click the raise hand button if you would like to ask a question via audio. And my colleague Badema is going to help field and moderate the questions. So, um, so Badema, do you want to start with one from the Q&A and then? Of course. Can... Thanks, Lauren, for this excellent talk. Um, so there is a question by anonymous attendee who is asking, have you found any difference between women recalling sexual assault between uh, when their interviewer is male or female? Thank you so much for your question. It's a great question. Um, and it's one that I spent a lot of time thinking about and trying to track in over the course of this project. Um, at this moment in time, I am inclined to think that it is not the most significant thing in terms of why women choose to share these stories in the moment of the interview. A um, couple of reasons why. So I have women who, who, uh, who took part in multiple interviews. Um, and say for instance, a woman, uh, she was interviewed by two different women, uh, but she discloses more in one interview compared to the other, but she's still being interviewed by a woman on both of those occasions. Uh, other women who, you know, you can have a male interviewer, you can have a female interviewer, and she discloses more to the man. Um, there's also this really quite delightful uh, interview that I was looking at earlier that the woman was interviewed by uh, both a man and a woman. Um, and the comment that she made to them was along the lines that, you know, she was very grateful that they put her at ease. Um, and she felt like she actually says this, that that helped her open up and share these more intimate stories. She doesn't explicitly say, oh, yes, I told you about my sexual assault because you two are so nice. It's, it's all kind of coded and, and you need to sort of read between the lines. But I think that that is what she is referring to. Um, I think if you want to go back into like theory, um, I really enjoy Henry Greenspan's work on this. He very much, um, you know, from his own work seems, you know, understands the interview process as a process of co-construction and emphasizes the importance of building a good rapport between interviewer and participant, and that goes across any context, right? Not just um, when you're talking about Holocaust survivors. So um, I'm not sure, I'm not convinced by it as a point of view that gender is the most important thing. Having said that, <laughs> um, I have been wondering, but this is very much, a, again, a thought in process. Um, when I've been looking at the vaginal assaults, right, this is um, an assault carried out under the context of a, of a body search. 
there, there are sometimes moments where I think, or rather I wonder if that coding process that I talked about is significant when the survivor is talking to a woman, because sometimes, um, sometimes they are very subtle. And I wonder if, you know, I wonder if the, if the survivor is being that subtle because she's talking to a woman, because, you know, in the life of a woman, you do have gynecological exams, you have a smear test. So it's kind of like a shared knowledge base that is present, but that is very specific only in that, con you know, in that particular type of assault being shared. But I wouldn't, you know, I don't know if that's true or if that's just something that I need to go and look at further. Thank you, Lauren. All right, we'll go to one of our audio questions. Just as a reminder, if you want to ask a question by audio, you click the raise hand button at the bottom. And there's going to be a bit of a lag because I have to allow the person to unmute and then they can speak. So that will be just a second. We'll start with Anna Haikova. OK. Anna? Hi. Hi. This is amazing. Thank you, Lauren. I really think that PhD and your book promises to be such an important contribution to the Holocaust field and basically to one of the most important questions in Holocaust field and I should say Marta you can then scratch my written question because I'm just asking it live so I guess I would like you to reflect Lauren judging from your research not only for this talk but generally overall um, what group is the most frequent among perpetrators is it the German slash Nazis? Is it the bystanders? Or is it fellow prisoners? Thank you. Thank you, Anna, for um, <laughs> generous <laughs> comments there. Um, so let me just, sorry, I'm pulling up a document because I have also been thinking about this and um, it's quite the list of people who, who are involved here. Um, I think because of, if you take such a broad, you know, if you include so many different types of assault, then you, you do get different types of perpetrators. Um, the assaults that I've come across so far um, are carried out by individuals that include, and this is a non-exhaustive list again, uh, German forces, which are sometimes identified as soldiers or SS or Gestapo, but there's also a sort of, you're not entirely sure if the survivor is identifying the, you know, them quite right in that, as who they will actually be. Um, they're carried out by Soviet partisans, by Jewish partisans, by male aid givers. This is across France, Belgium, the Netherlands and Poland. Hungarian soldiers, both men and women, Hungarian policemen slash gendarmes, local Hungarian and Romanian midwives, and also Jewish men in, in the sort of ghetto elites and who occupy positions of power in a camp setting. Um, and there, there was actually another example that I thought about when I was trying to go to sleep the other night and, and now it's escaped me, but it's very broad. And like you've suggested, I, I too am interested to see who comes out most frequently. Thanks. Uh, Lauren, I will continue reading the questions from the Q&A, but please be free to also raise your hand and ask your question live. Uh, so there's another question by an anonymous attendee who is asking uh, why you choose, uh, why you chose to use the term sexualized uh, violence. Yes. Um, <laughs> thank you for that question. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure. Maybe I know this person who's asked this question because someone else um, I, I was talking about this recently with, um, and I had to actually go back and and kind of figure out why I was. You know, you know when you make a choice and and you sort of you know put it away for a while and then you slightly forget where where that idea has come from. Um, and when I, you know, I went to the books and um, there's this chapter in, in um, Hedgebeth and Zadel's 2010 edited collection 
um, sexualized violence against women, against Jewish women during the Holocaust. And it's a chapter by Brigitte Halbermeyer. And, and I think this is where my choice to use that term comes from. Um, and if you don't mind, I will quote from her because she just explains it in such a brilliant way. So she says that the term sexualized violence makes it clear that male violence against females is not about sexuality, but is a show of power on the part of the perpetrator and includes many forms of violence with sexual connotations, including humiliation, intimidation and destruction. Violence can be understood as sexualized if they are directed at the most intimate part of a person and as such against the person's physical, emotional and spiritual integrity. The goal of all forms of sexualized violence is the demonstration of power and dominance through the humiliation and degradation of the other. And for me, that just really spoke to how I didn't want to be, I didn't want to feel limited by that as a sort of key definition when I was going to be looking at different kinds of assaults. So I was aware, or rather I predicted that there would be things that, that I would hear and, and really have to think about, you know, if this is a sort of sexualized form of violence. And, and so I, I think it gives you room as a term to be more inclusive, which is really important in this field and has been commented on a lot. Um, you know, for me, there was another point, um, you know, there's a great German history round table from a couple of years ago, um, you know, Anna Heike is on it, Elisa Mayland is on it, um, I think um, Atina Grossman's there as well, and Doris Bergen and, and a few other people, and, and Doris Bergen talked about that there was still a tendency to reduce women's victimization to sexual violence, to define sexual violence narrowly as rape, and in the process erase women and other victims as persons, which is so not what I wanted to do. I wanted to cast the net wide. So I, yeah, I want, that's kind of why I go for that term. Um, but recently I have, I have been including uh, sexual assaults as well. Um, yeah. Thank you, Lauren. So we have quite a few questions and they're really good. So uh, I'm gonna read the question that has gotten the most upvotes from attendees. Oh, Thank you, Lauren, great talk. This is from Jessica Rapson. I was wondering oh. how it has been to be immersed in this topic against the background of a huge upsurge in discourse around violence against women and girls in the UK following the death of Sarah Everard. I'm not implying connections between the historical contexts of the same issues with language have, a, have emerged. Oops, sorry, one second. Um, women's, women's safety versus male violence against women. That's the example of the language. Given the need for education on such matters, it seems more important to me than ever that these narratives are included in education and commemoration of historical events too. Thank you. And thank you so much for your question, Jessica. Um, for those of you who don't know, <clears throat> excuse me, Jessica is, um, is a very important part of my supervision team. Um, so thank you for that as a question. Um, oh, that was working on this material um, is usually fine in the sense that I have developed almost like a muscle for it. Um, you do build resilience over time, even if in the beginning you don't think you will, um, but it does come eventually. But yeah, the case of Sarah Everard was was a very difficult few days because you know this is my this is my working world, and you know as as you say, Jessica, there were huge parallels. Um, you know, there were a lot of conversations here in the UK about state actors, which connects into broader conversations that seem to be breaching the sort of general discourse over the past year and a half, couple of years, decade, depending on your, you know, circle of people, um, about brutality. And it, it, it made for a very difficult 
few days because it felt as if every woman who I've ever met and many hundreds who I haven't were disclosing about sexual assault, which um, is obviously, well, I mean, it's a double-edged sword, right? Because, you know, you would hope that they wouldn't have to dis anything to disclose, but that's life. Um, you know, but it, it was great to see women taking up public space uh, to talk about these things. But it, it, it just made it quite an intense few days for me as a researcher. Um, I think I've been thinking recently um, because of a conversation with a friend uh, who suggested that we maybe think on collaborating something, collaborating on something based on this research in, a, in an educational context. I mean, it's very early stages as a conversation, but I'm, I'm aware that these kinds of stories don't tend to breach in an extent mainstream Holocaust knowledge, right? Um, they, they exist in this really rich, this really great vein of literature that has been developed over the past couple of decades but there is still this like reticence, um, although hopefully, sorry, I'm going off on a tangent, you know, places like the Imperial War Museum here in London, I know that their curate, curatorial team are working hard to include narratives of sexualized violence during conflict in their new, um, you know, in the new rooms that are coming one day, hopefully. Um, but yeah, I, it, I'm, so, I'm slightly losing my train of thought. Sorry, Jessica and everyone else. Um, suffice to say that yes, it, it can be very difficult to work on when the world sort of erupts in a kind of parallel conversation to your research. Um, but it, it also can be very illuminating for my research. Weirdly, it was slightly empowering for me in terms of thinking about state actors and body searches and violence and, and all the rest. Um, so yeah, I. I hope that answers your question <laughs> in, in not too much of a rambling way. I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you, Lauren. So let's do a couple, I'll ask you a couple of questions now and you can answer both of them because I want to get through um, as many Great. questions <laughs> as we can. We're going to be ask, asking Sorry. you questions for the, I'll no, no, <laughs> no. So the first is, um, in reference to the art displayed on the first slide. Can you talk a bit about your decision to contextualize your research and this presentation with a work of art? That's question number one. And question number two is um, from our fellow Chad Gibbs and our affiliated researcher. Excellent talk, Lauren. I wonder if you could tell us more about what you call breakaway storytelling. Could you comment on how often this took place in your sample set? Thank you again for sharing your work and all you did to get through the 2021 hurdles. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you. Very Two great questions. Um, I'll start with Chad's first. Um, so the order in which that I talked about those, um, those different sort of I forget what word I use, um, where how stories come through. Um, the largest group is of women who just you know, embed into their narrative. The second largest group is of the breakaway stories. And then the, the next, you know, reducing numbers again is, um, is in response to a question. Um, I cannot give you a, a, con a condensed, condensed, a correct, sorry, number um, right now, but they, they're very exciting. I think if, if we go back to that, you know, they they didn't have to talk about this you know they 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 made that choice to go backwards that this was so important to them i think that's a, a it's such an important expression of women wanting to talk about these stories and and thinking that the context of a holocaust testimony interview was a completely okay place to do that um and I don't really have much more to say on that right now, but it's it's they're a group of women who I really want to focus in on more um, over the next year of 
time that I have left before handing. Um, yeah, the choice of an artwork for that first question uh, was, you know, Martha Wolf and I, um, it, it kind of, it was a negotiation, <laughs> but we were all aiming for the same thing. Um, you know, it's very difficult to think of how to illustrate a talk like this in a kind of, in the best way possible, in an appropriate way, in a respectful way, right? Because that's the main thing here, that these stories need to be respected um, when you're working with them. Um, I didn't feel comfortable in terms of, um, say, taking a screenshot from a particular woman because I thought, you know, oh, it's not my place to make them the face of sexualized violence during the Holocaust. Um, so that was one option overruled. Uh, I had a very dry <laughs> um, idea of using a screenshot from the indexing um, in the archive, but uh, thankfully, Martha said that that was a terrible idea for a visual representation. <laughs> she was right, <laughs> um, you know, so that and another idea went. Um, and then, you know, a group of, uh, so when I started off my PhD, I really wanted to think more about representation, right, of, of how these stories move through public spaces. Whereas now I'm more interested in the women's stories themselves. But the work I did during that time um, I encountered the Remember the Women Institute um, in that research process and the brilliant work that they have done for a very long time now. Um, but there's this fantastic exhibition that they put on a couple of years ago in, in collaboration with a couple of other groups. I, I hope that's the right way of, of describing that. It's called Violated um, and it was where they had artistic representations of sexualized violence during the Holocaust, as well as artistic representations of, um, of sexualized violence in other genocides. And, you know, that it just popped into my head when I was thinking of, of how to illustrate this. So I went to their catalog, which is available online. I highly encourage you all to go and look at it. It's so interesting. And then it was, a, it was pretty much a case of working through that thinking about who the artist was. I really wanted the artist to be a Holocaust survivor, which in, in this case um, they are. Um, I didn't want naked women. <laughs> I didn't really want, um, you know, there's some really interesting pieces there that are almost like remediations of perpetrator photographs. And they are remediated very much with the intention of kind of reclaiming those, um, you know, those stories and, and whatnot away from that perpetrator kind of hold. But I, I, I wasn't, you know, I think they're great, um, but it just didn't feel right to put as a, as a lead image. Um, and then, yeah, I think, that, I think that left us with three choices. Um, and then I chose the one that I chose. Um, it felt like a sort of, yeah, it was still centering a survivor voice, a, a woman's survivor voice. Um, and it was something that I, you know, if you read the, the, the information that's also part of that, um, of that catalog of the exhibition, it's something that I think the artist recalls as, as witnessing secondhand. So it just felt like the right choice to make. Thank you, Lauren. Okay, there are, many more questions and I apologize in advance if we can't get to all of them. I'm gonna ask um, one from Regina Muhlhauser. Uh, thank you, Lauren, what a great talk. I learned a lot today and think your approach is really helpful for our understanding. I'm really struck by the way Lucina Goldberg describes her perpetrator. It's the first time I see, I see a narrative about a woman who talks about the perpetrator's behavior after the rape. My first question, do you have more cases like this? And if I understood you correctly, you interpret her narrative of him as him being ashamed. This I find really interesting as I'm always wondering about the ways that victims and perpetrators experience each other in what is a very intimate practice, i.e. sexual violence. My second question thus is, how can we distinguish between the women survivors and the perpetrators perspectives? From my knowledge of perpetrator narratives, I think men might be ashamed, but they also feel sorry for themselves. 
Thank you, Regina, for those two very detailed questions that I will be honest, I don't think I will be able to do justice off the top of my head right here and now. I want to say that there are more women who discuss their perpetrators, but off the top of my head, I genuinely write, you know, I suspect there are, but I cannot remember. <laughs> um, so I apologize, but I can, you know, let you know about that in due course, if you would like. Um, I mean, yes, there, is, yeah, she does identify shame in his response. Um, it's there, it's, it's narrated in, it's, it's a very evident. Um, and I think that is part of the, yeah, part of the interaction, part of what we have to look at in her, in her recounting of this moment. Um, sorry, I, sometimes you get asked very big questions and I don't have a response right now, but thank you so much for giving me something to think about. Um, and yes, I will think about that more and maybe get back to you, Regina, if that's okay. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Lauren and Regina. Sorry. Okay, the next question is from Sari Siegel. She says, thank you, Lauren. Holocaust survivor testimonies are still being recorded. With all of your exposure to the VHA testimonies, how would you suggest that future interviewers try to get accounts of sexualized violence on the record before it's too late? What questions or prompts should an interviewer ask or use without veering into being too invasive and disrespectful? Brilliant question. Um, one that I can actually answer right now. So that's great, um, not to keep passing on them. Um, so from the Olga Kovac interview, I think um, there was a reason why I left that long pause up at the end where it's almost like both Olga and the interviewer sit with what she's just told um, what she's just disclosed but I think that gap also was a signal from the interviewer that so that Olga could carry on if she wanted to um, she wasn't being rushed and I think that is important sorry I'm, I'm sort of answering this question backwards um, something that is in the Lucina Goldberg interview is this great moment where the interviewer actually mimics the language of Lucina, which is something that I've seen, um, you know, it happens a lot in, in terms of thinking about building rapport with someone of signaling that you are listening and that you're hearing what they're saying and that you're picking up on these kind of, these covert cues, these coded cues maybe. Um, so Lucina says, um, I went through a terrible thing before and the interviewer says, what, what terrible thing? And then we get the story. Um, I think it's, there's also, um, there's also interviews where women say something along the lines of, I've had it, I had a bad experience. I had a terrible experience. I think it's worth bearing in mind that if someone maybe hints at something like that, that's where you pause, hence why I said I explained this backwards. Um, and yeah, just think about how your questions are actually in conversation with what's being said, because there's so many interviews, like there's a terrible example um, of someone who, I mean, she literally, I think, says, oh, I was raped. And then her interviewer is like, okay, that's nice. Can we come back to that in five minutes? I just want to ask you about your ghetto experience. Not cool. Don't do that. Um, thankfully, she, she kind of carries on. But there are also women who, who uh, I have corroborated from other interviews or from written memoirs, who you can see it say um, that the story is present somewhere else. And you can, you can literally go in and see the same kind of like cue points. But for one reason and another, the interviewer just hasn't picked up on it. And then it, it, it you know, we move on. Um, so it's just about listening. Um, and, you know, Joan Ringelheim is great on this. Um, her really famous quote about, 
I believe that we avoid listening to stories that we don't want to hear. Sometimes we avoid listening because we're afraid. Sometimes we avoid listening because we don't understand the importance of what is being said. Um, it's all about listening. Thank you, Lauren. So we're approaching the half hour mark. I'll ask one more question from the Q&A and we couldn't even get to them all. So thank you to all the attendees who are participating in such a lively way. Uh, the question is from Jade and she says, in my own research, I came across the testimony of a woman who recounted her experience of sexual violence very differently in two different interviews given years apart. In one, she recounts how she suffered at the hands of her rapist and in the other, she discusses how she resisted her assault. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you have come across anything similar in your own research and how much you think changes in recollection, how much are changes in recollection such as this due to changes in the society's knowledge and understanding of the prominence of sexual violence in conflict? Great question. Um, so I have women for whom they disclose more details over time, their story. Um, I have other women who disclose less details over time. I have women for whom there's no correlation whatsoever. You know, they, they do multiple interviews and, and yeah, it's very uneven. Um, I think we have to remember that these interviews are always reconstructions. And so there's so many factors that go into why someone may tell a story in one way on one day compared to another day. And, you know, that can be things that are going on in their personal lives, which we can, we just have no awareness of, right? The, you know, the PIQ, the pre-interview questionnaires don't record it. The interview doesn't really record it. So we just have to go with what is, what's on screen. Um, I think culturally, uh, I was talking to Wolf about this the other day. Um, there is, there's definitely an increase in in broader conversations over time as to you know questions like what what is rape, um, but you also have that alongside these very um, judgmental narratives. You know, you can see this in like legal cases of you know contemporary sexual assault. Um, this yeah that we judge women you know the, the famous one is like she asked for it right um it's something that I wish I would love to draw on more contextually for for this work but because when I think when you look at the the range of locations um you know the different religious you know religious context the, everything going on in a survivor's identity um, in the moment that they recount, it can make it slightly difficult to definitely say, oh, this is why someone is, is saying this on this day compared to this on this day. Um, someone who does this really well, I think, is, um, or has a, a good approach to this, is Hannah Polingale. Her book, Ecologies of Witnessing, is very cool for want of a better word. <laughs> and when I read it, I was like, oh, I wish I could do this for, you know, for my project right now. That's, you know, it's just not possible. Um, but yeah, I think, I think we need to be careful in terms of not, um, how to phrase this, not imposing um, this idea that women may disclose more over time because that's not the case. Um, as far as I can make out, there's just no evidence to support that in for these women. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a very interesting thing. Um, and it's very exciting when you find someone who has multiple mnemonic outputs that you can then, you know, go and look at. Uh, yeah, I get very excited about that. Okay, wonderful. We have one more question and then we're gonna wrap it up. And this is an audio question from Michael Baitler. Michael, you're muted at the moment. Oh, uh, can you hear me? I can hear you now, yeah. Yeah, I just, the, about 15 years ago, there was a conference at UCLA 
on the so-called comfort women, you know, the sex slaves, um, you know, during in the Pacific War. And a number of these women, you know, they're still alive. They came together and they spoke about it. And um, just wonder what kind of, you know, connection has there been between, you mentioned other genocides, other situations, massive abuses, where there is a crosstalk between the victims. Thank you, Michael. Um, so again, this is something that I need to work on within my own project and, and bring into my analysis more that continuum of conflict and violence against women specific to a second world war context. Um, in terms of, I mean, there's a lot of activism right now around um, the so, you know, it's a, it's a perpetrator term, so that's why we say so-called comfort women, um, that, you know, I see people like Regina Mulhauser, who are, you know, very evident in this field, coming, you know, taking part in that activism. So there's a great, I think, cross-collaboration that way, um, which I need to do more research about in a kind of formalized articles, comparative nature, um, in order to bring into my own work in that sense. Um, it's, it's weirdly evident actually, if you look at um, memorials, there's been a lot I think written about in terms of people compare museum exhibition spaces um, to memorials and, you know, statues um, of the, you know, that commemorate the this so-called comfort women um, atrocity. Uh, but yeah, I need to do more work in terms of bringing that into my own research to be able to answer your question properly. Thank you, Lauren. Well, if I turn it over to you. Yeah, uh, so thank you, Lauren, for this really, really uh, insightful talk uh, 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 in your work in progress. And I think uh, uh, if already this work in progress give us so much uh, food for thought, I uh, really uh, can only second the anticipation uh, for the dissertation. So thank you so much for your research. And I think I want to also thank uh, the um, uh, fellowship uh, which we have, which actually enables this, the Robert J. Katz Fellowship, because without the fellowship, uh, this in-depth, really uh, giving time to do this in type of in-depth research would not be possible. And also, I just want to uh, um, uh, repeat that I also am grateful to the co-sponsoring of this event uh, by the uh, USC Dornside Department of Gender and Sexuality Studies. I want to thank Marta and Badema for really, again, kind of making this a smooth, smooth experience Experience for everybody. And uh, thanks to all the uh, members of the audience. And I'm really grateful for this uh, rich discussion. Um, and I hope we see you again for the next talk um, in a, a few days already. So thank you very much. And go to our website um, uh, and uh, find out the dates for the next uh, events. Thank you so much, Lauren, Marta, Badema, and everybody in the audience. Thank you. Thank you.